Governor, Governor your remarks on uh, beaches, you. sorry, your remarks on beaches and salons and churches come on the same day that Charlie Baker, Governor Baker, announced his plans to reopen Massachusetts, and those are three areas where now Massachusetts will kind of leapfrog Rhode Island. While recognizing that Rhode Island is still ahead on restaurants and retail, what do you say to Rhode Islanders who look at this, especially because Massachusetts has been more hard hit, and say, how come they're now ahead of us? Uh, well, they aren't actually ahead of us insofar as they're beginning by opening manufacturing and construction, which we've never closed. They're a little bit ahead on, on churches, as you say. You know, there'll be a weekend before us on churches. Uh, you know, it's a consistent approach, whether you're one week ahead or one week behind, that everyone kind of has to make that decision. As I said, I've been spent my team, we're talking constantly to the people on the ground in Rhode Island, you know, the the folks who are leaders of faith communities, the we're doing today again the town hall on hairdressers. Uh, it's a judgment call, but I think that it's it's roughly consistent, which is to say open in phases. And if it's plus or minus a week here or there, I think that that's something you'll see. I would tell you this, and this is this is the important point, though. Um, I, I my approach, the approach I'm taking, has has been to prioritize work, right? To get we have we have hundreds of thousands of people collecting unemployment. We have an economic crisis in Rhode Island, so I have said, you know, I kept the social gathering limit low to prioritize getting folks back to work. That's a decision. The other thing, the approach we're taking, which is consistent with every public health expert that I've talked to at the state level, the federal level, at Brown, at Johns Hopkins, et cetera, is you want to make some changes and then leave 10 to 14 days to look at the effects of those changes and then make other changes and you and so that's what we're doing like I understand in Massachusetts they're doing every week changes that's a different approach we're taking a different approach um, and we are take my other primary objective is to only do this once we want to go slow and steady so we never have to go back a phase the the consequences of having to go backwards emotionally, financially, to our health care are significant. So my approach is slow and steady so we get it right and don't go backwards. So anyway, that's how we're thinking about it. I think we're doing well and there'll be a few things here or there where we differ by a week or two. Governor, I'd like to follow up on our conversation from Friday on high school graduations. I heard from a number of parents, I heard from school officials, and what I heard was that your administration is sending mixed messages specifically about wearing masks at these either virtual or in person. Now, the Department of Education website still says you have to wear a mask. A senior official from your administration who's been dealing with the superintendents has been privately saying, well, you know, if they take the mask off, who's gonna be around to be able to enforce that? And so the superintendent of West Warwick, I presented that to you the other day, and you said, well, that sounds reasonable, let me get back to you. She called your office Friday afternoon after the press conference, and she said, the governor's office returned my call with the following official response that no new guidance was forthcoming, but that common sense should prevail. Each district should consider the unique and individual needs of their community. Mm -hmm. And they said, what's different than the three of you standing up there, a parent and a kid coming for a picture 15 mm -hmm. seconds on and off? That's not the official line from your administration. Mm -hmm. So for the thousands of high school graduates who are ready to go, what's the message about coming up, taking your mask off, getting a picture, and walking off the stage? Yeah. Is that still a problem? So let me say this. To the thousands of graduates, whether they be college or high school, my first message is congratulations, and I'm sorry you have to be going going through it this way. I will say you'll never forget it. You know, this is going to be a unique way to graduate and I hope you get as creative as possible and make it memorable and have some fun with it. Um, the Department of Health and the Department of Education have put out clear guidelines. We haven't changed those guidelines and it's up to every superintendent to figure out how to get creative and have a safe graduation within those guidelines. 
You know, we're not in the business, and I cannot be in the business, of telling everybody exactly, is this okay, is that okay? There are guidelines, they are clear. Superintendents need to look at the guidelines, interpret them, get creative, and make their decisions and do their best. That is what I am well, telling you. That's not what they're saying privately. What they're saying, you've got to look at that, this, but, but you know, read between yeah. the lines. Here's the thing. The, the fact is, common sense does have to prevail. And I would say that that's, this is going to be an issue that's going to come up again and again and again in the next nine months, right? Like, as I said from the beginning, we have rules to keep you alive and healthy. And it's in your best interest, all of our interest, to figure out ways to follow the rules, not ask how you can get around the rules. Now, you know the rules. You have to stay six feet apart. If you can't stay six feet apart, you better be wearing a mask. You know what's different inside versus outside. So certain common sense has to prevail. That that scenario that I outlined, you come, you take your mask off for 15 seconds, and you go across, mm -hmm. you said that sounded reasonable. To me, it does. With it, Dr. Alexander Scott? But she doesn't, we don't know all the other details, right? So the thing, and this is why I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of every single hypothetical. There are guidelines. They are clear. You know, if you're a superintendent, you have a job to do. It's not an easy job. You need to figure it out, get creative, and keep people safe. If you have crowds of kids lining up before they come up, that's a problem. So it's the whole context. Like this, I don't know how many people we have here, a dozen or something, but we're in a huge auditorium. This is safe. So, you know, I think there's ways to be safe and creative and follow the rules. I'm going to ask you to go down a rabbit hole for a second. Uh, you said that folks were uh, generally following the regulations this weekend, but folks on Eaton Street would say that's not the case at you know, the PC situation. So can yeah. you react to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, we send out our inspectors who went town to town, shop to shop, and by and large, we saw 90 plus percent compliance, particularly with mask wearing. Way to go, Rhode Island. A week ago, employees were wearing, all wearing masks. Uh, not all the shoppers were. We saw much better compliance this weekend, so I want to say thank you. Yeah, the kids, as I get older, I, they call them kids, you know, the young people, they need to do better. This isn't a joke. And we're going to, the, the whole response from us going forward is going to be more pinpointed. Like we're seeing with communities now, you know, in Central Falls and Providence and Woonsocket, in nursing homes, our whole response is pinpointed. It's not okay for kids to be, or young people or anybody, to be congregating. We heard of a few big birthday parties in different communities this weekend, and we went and shut them down. And we're going to continue to do that. Just to follow up on it, Providence hasn't issued a single fine yet to, to anybody. And I know you said that's not the mm. number one goal or anything, but you look at what happened again in the PC area, and I think the average person says, how does no one you know, face any penalty yeah. for that? That's fair. I think that is fair. We have sent, I know we, we've sent the state police to deal with parties, and they've been successful at breaking them up without finding folks or shutting them down before they start without finding folks. So at this point, I have to leave it to the discretion of local law enforcement. They're the ones who are the professionals. They have to balance, you know, they have to de-escalate a situation and get compliance. A fine is a tool in their toolbox to enforce, and we're going to trust them to use their judgment. But it is a tool in the toolbox, and we are serious about this. And by the way, as summer comes, if we start to see big social gatherings, we are going to have to shut them down. Governor, I'm going to ask, though, Narragansett Beach, North Kingstown at Rome Point, I saw softball teams in uniform mm. having games. Where? In Warwick. You know, you, how does someone who's in an area that's, you know, let's say Central Falls right now, square what's going on in Narragansett and other parts of South County where there were, you know, civilians moving parking barricades and entering the beach, yeah. how does someone square that with their own experience? With, the, with their own experience? You know, that is... 
province. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, that is so frustrating that people would do that. I know this is hard, right? I know we're, we have cabin fever. We cannot fight. It, you, it is foolish to think you can trick the virus, outrun the virus, try to get around the rules. If that's happening, three weeks from now, we're going to see a problem in that community. It won't happen now. You'll have a good time now. And then three weeks from now, a lot of people will get sick. You don't have to be a rocket. Look at what's happening in Sweden. Look at what's happen Look what happens in other communities in the country or around the world. You don't follow the rules. You get restless. People get sick and die. And then we have to shut down businesses. So I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know about that. Clearly, we have work to do. Um, the other thing is, listen, we want to get to that next phase and then that next phase. So I'm asking folks, as hard as it is, and I know it's hard, just hang in there a little bit longer because you do have people in Central Falls, in Woonsocket, in Providence. You know, the test positive rates in those communities at some of our inner city sites is nearly 20 percent. That's a problem. Um, so anyway, I, how do you square it? I guess I would ask everyone in Rhode Island to really, truly recognize we are all in this together. We are all Rhode Islanders. And just hang in there for your fellow Rhode Islanders. Just because your community is in bad shape, there's one 25 miles up the road that is. And if you, help, if you follow the rules a bit longer, we'll all be healthier and we can all get back to work. Linda, at what point do colleges have to take responsibility for their students? So as we know, a number of the colleges plan to come back this fall, hope mm -hmm. to come back. That's going to be a huge influx of kids. At what point is the onus on them? Yeah, um, entirely, I would say. I mean, which, which is to say, if not entirely, substantially. I mean, um, we have asked all the colleges let me say this. I support, if colleges want to come back in, in September, when they come back, we want to support and enable that. We've asked all the colleges to give to us their reopening plans. We've given them a deadline, I think, for early or mid-June. We've told them what a complete plan has to look like, and we're going to work hand in hand with them to, get that, to make that plan happen. Uh, and we're going to support them. It's on us, you know, we, us, the state, we have to help them with testing, we have to provide them with guidance, we have to help them uh, in any number of different ways, and we will do that. But f fundamentally, it's, it's the responsibility of the colleges to themselves create and enforce their own plans around social distancing, online classes, dormitory living, they're going to have to be doing more cleaning, more PPE. Um, obviously for the state universities, you know, we'll be able to provide financial assistance to help with that. Governor, um, Massachusetts uh, slightly ahead of us with churches and salons. Mm. What guidance do you want to offer Rhode Islanders who may go to church or go to a, a hair salon in Massachusetts and then they come back? Yeah, you know, I hope they don't. I hope they wait another week because that would be the safer thing to do. Um, but it's the same guidance, you know, if you, if you go to the Stop and Shop in Seekonk, as we've said, it's okay. Um, just be careful and, you know, come home and in Rhode Island, follow the rules in Rhode Island. And just a quick follow-up on that. Um, you mentioned that Rhode Island, the churches, would probably need the next two weeks to get ready. Is, is there a working plan right now? Have they not offered something that would be safe? I think, I'm not exactly sure, but Mass is like 40% full. Mm -hmm. But do they not have a working plan it's, right now? That's exactly what we're working through. So we spent last week on it, the weekend on it. We're really close. I think by Wednesday, Thursday of this week, that working plan will be online with a lot more details. 
The details. One more with beaches. Um, so Roger Wheeler is not open? Roger Wheeler is not open. Governor, I'm you don't want to have your beach own beach open? open. <laughs> I clearly do not have any pull in this administration. So, Governor, what was the thought between having just those two beaches open? If, if you want to eliminate crowding, why not open more and kind of spread Such it out a little bit? That's a good question, Brian. Now you have a view into my life these days. You know, there's no easy answers. That's exactly a potential risk. Again, I'm relying in my faith in Rhode Islanders not to crowd. Some of it is just operational. This is a heavy lift for Janet Coit and the team at DEM. By the way, thank you to Janet Coit and the team at DEM. They are working double, triple overtime on this. Um, just today to open Goddard Park and the last few remaining parks is extra. It's a heavy lift to safely reopen even two beaches. You know, the extra porta parties, the extra enforcement, et cetera, making sure we have compliance. So it was a balance between getting it right operationally. You could do that more easily with two than five and the concern that you raise. Um, so so that's how we came up with that. Just to follow up on the, the, the East Matunic has a small parking lot, actually. So that's a good thing. That was part of the thinking. Are you considering weaving fees on beaches all summer at this point? Probably not. News. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably not. It's free. Let me say this. You can, I don't think you can in good conscience, ask folks to pay for a beach if there's no bathrooms, no showers, no concessions, no lifeguards. But once we get back into the business of having lifeguards, parking attendants, amenities, um, I think you can get back into the business of having a fee, because frankly, we need to pay for lifeguards, folks to clean, et cetera. John. Governor, uh, a couple of weeks ago, your emphasis was really on testing mm -hmm. and uh, ramping up the test. Where do we stand today? And what have you found from your test results? What do you see trending here? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna answer that and then I'd like to have the doctor answer that. Um, I feel very good about where we are with our testing. Now it isn't perfect, okay? But if you look at us compared to really any other state, we're doing better than in most cases, or just as well as. I can't find any other state who's doing a better job, meaningfully. Uh, the area that we still have to continue to get better at is testing in communities that are most affected and doing it in ways that are in the community and everybody can go and can get their tests for free or covered by insurance. Um, th we're having very good success with the program at Stop and Shop. People are showing up, people are getting their tests. Now that's just to get a broad view of what's happening in Rhode Island. Um, that's not for folks who are sick. So we're overlaying that kind of surveillance testing on top of our symptomatic testing. That is going well. Uh, and also the blood testing. So I would say, you know, we, ha we, have, a, we have a plan on testing. Um, we wanna test anyone who has symptoms within a day of those symptoms and get them results within another day. We want to test broadly in the community, like this surveillance test, doing a lot of testing to see what's going on in Rhode Island, how many, what percent of our population has built up antibodies, are there any particular communities we should be worried about, and then outbreaks. We need to be on it on an outbreak. We wanna be at the site of an outbreak within four hours and have everybody tested within two days so we can contain an outbreak. We call it SOS, Symptoms, Outbreaks, Surveillance. Oh. As testing their employees? Excellent question. It's going to depend on the business. So I'm glad you brought that up. Many large businesses who have like a big corporate campus are probably going to want to do their own on campus testing. That's because they want to do it. That's because they want to provide that like as a benefit to employees and to develop confidence in their workforce. And if they want to go ahead and do that, they, that's on their dime, and we'll help them. You know, we're helping them figure out how to do it. 
Our job is to make sure that every Rhode Islander of every business, big or small, can, can get access to testing. The place that we are in closest contact with smaller businesses on, particularly manufacturers, is around the outbreak testing. In other words, if there's an outbreak in a manufacturing operation where people work close in space, they need to know from us, we're gonna get there and help them and, I, and we're in good shape with that. Did you wanna talk about the trends? So to start with the first question that you asked about testing in terms of what we are seeing, over this past weekend, we uh, surpassed 100,000 tests uh, 100,000 tests being done. Uh, so we are beyond 10% of our population, far exceeding what's occurring in other states. Uh, we want to continue to advance that because the more we are able to test and uh, capture the landscape of particularly people with symptoms, the better able we are to quickly get them isolated, contact their uh, direct contacts and get them quarantined because that's critical to stopping transmission. The trend that we have been following to help understand that is percent positives. If we're testing enough people, um, we will start to see over time the percent of people who are positive start to decrease. The focus is being less than 10%. We are that for the state, but we do have, as the governor mentioned, communities that are not less than 10%. And that is where we really want to be focused in pushing resources to those communities, help make sure they have what they need to be able to isolate and quarantine effectively. Uh, and to provide the, the support. Our work is to, going forward, continue to engage with providers that are able to, to offer an infrastructure that we can leverage for testing. And as the governor uh, touched on with our SOS testing strategy as a state, symptomatics, outbreaks, and then sentinel surveillance, our early warning system, we really want to build out that early warning um, surveillance sentinel sy testing system so that we can better understand how disease is transmitted and then engage various sectors, education, work sectors, and others um, with testing and helping to determine the best way to respond going forward. Ms. Doctor, with the surveillance testing, where do we stand on that? About how many people have accepted the initial 5,000 household invitations? What percentage? and how many absolute numbers have been tested and do you have any results yet and if not when do you anticipate a release of those results we're continuing to collect the numbers in terms of where we uh, have landed last but there has been a robust response where people have been interested in participating in the random sampling approach of our uh, testing. Um, and we want to continue to learn from that and expand it further, really build out into the communities that are hardest hit, and we'll continue to share data. There are two benefits that we will get. One is to better understand the spread of disease, who's most impacted at a population level, and the other is to help individuals. We've learned and are continuing to emphasize that these tests work best with someone who has symptoms. So if someone does not have symptoms and gets tested as a part of our early warning system, Sentinel surveillance testing program, which we are encouraging, we want to make sure they know clearly it's only beneficial if it's positive. That allows us to respond quickly, get them isolated, and reach out to their contacts to be quarantined. If a test is negative, there's much less information we can take from that in terms of changing their behavior. We want people to still stay home if they are sick and to continue to conduct the social distancing and hand washing and all of the elements that we know are critical to stop transmission of COVID-19. Thank you, everyone. Governor, are you going to any outside dining tonight, today? No. 